LSU, Alabama, need we say more? It's for the West, most likely. Let's get it on with Carter. You can catch him on a Power Hour LSU, Power Hour SEC right here on YouTube. Carter, what's going on today? Man, you are right. It, it is more than likely for the West. But if Ole Miss, of course, beats Georgia, we get just unreal chaos. Um Mark, I'm excited, man. This is uh, one of the best college football seasons we've ever had, and I can't wait for one of the more intriguing LSU-Bama games. Let's start with the guy, Jaden Daniels. If it's not for him uh, putting an offense on his shoulders and putting up ridiculous amounts of points and yardage, uh, I don't know if LSU is in this position. Uh, if they don't have two losses, I think he's heavily in the Heisman talk, probably should be anyway. Your thoughts about his maturity? Yeah, I, I think he is uh, the Heiser Trophy winner up to this point. I, I feel as if he has had to carry a team that has, Mark, put out their worst defense that they've ever had. And, you know, it's kind of weird. You know, LSU Bama used to just be, you know, the nine to six is defense versus defense. But really the intriguing side of the football for both teams are the offenses, right? This LSU defense has not been elite in years, right? Last year, they had a pretty good year overall, but faded towards the end. And this year, they've just not been good at all. Um, and Jaden has really had to carry this team. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of people watching Jaden Daniels for the first time. I cannot say this enough. He has carried a team uh, unlike any other uh, quarterback in all of college football. So seeing what he's done and taking the leap that he's taken is just truly breathtaking. Is the running game, in your estimation, giving him enough support? And are there hopes of it giving him enough support in games like this down the stretch? Yeah, that's the thing, Mark. LSU's been able to run the football unbelievably well. I mean, it's not been a home run hitting rushing attack from their running backs, but they have consistently dropped off seven, eight, 12, 13 yard runs with Logan Diggs. He transfer from Notre Dame. So if you're a Notre Dame fan watching this, you know, uh, Estime is a really good uh, running back for Notre Dame. Well, Logan Diggs and Estime uh, were, was basically a timeshare last year. And we see how good Estime is now as a guy, Logan Diggs, came into a running back room where there were seven scholarship guys already, and he has outperformed all of them. It's basically been his job. So I think LSU will be able to run the football uh, versus Alabama's front. That is very, very good. Against an Alabama defense that has obviously kept them in the playoff race and would be the best uh, defense that uh, LSU has faced, at least since Florida State may be the best this season. Totally agree. I mean, Braswell and Turner are the best pass rushing duo in the in the land. Um, 32 uh, lost and I believe for Alabama's having a really good season. Tim Smith, of course, is a, a really good player. And what I think Alabama's going to do is trust the, those guys to stop the run in the box and just commit as many guys as they can uh, to the passing attack. And one thing about LSU Bama over the years, Mark, I think the, the best mano a mano matchup has been elite LSU wide receiver going up against elite Bama DB or vice versa. And we're going to get this, right? You're going to get McKinstry going up against Brian Thomas Jr. and Malik Neighbors. And now we can talk about the defense because I'm looking up the numbers and I was not shocked. I knew exactly where to go around 100 in terms of total <laughs> defense, <laughs> yards per play. You know, I just went Phew! and yeah. uh, there they were about 109 and around 100 yards per play. <laughs> And that's coming off an Army game in which, of course, they pitched a shutout. So uh, it's tough to completely overhaul a unit during the season and make it that much better. But they obviously are searching for answers to try to be marginal, decent, to try to get them to an SEC championship game. Yeah, Mark, the, the, the key to winning a national championship, of course, is your talent, your schedule, but also injury luck. It is so important. And this LSU defense... Mark has not been good. I mean, it's just that simple. They've had two really good games in a row, but that was against Auburn, whose offense has been one of the worst in the SEC, and the other was against Army, who's starting a true freshman backup. So, yes, two good defensive performances where they've only given up 18 points total. But, Mark, the key stat is the injury thing, right? Zai Alexander is hurt, their best corner, right? He's out, and LSU's cornerback room behind him has been – not great 
at all. They, there's all kinds of chaos behind the scenes. Players that are quote unquote inactive for non health reasons. It's just been a mess, uh, in particular that cornerback room. And then one of the best players in America is uh, Makai Wingo, their defensive tackle, is out. So he won't, won't be back until, you know, bowl season. So LSU is going to need a lot of guys to step up. And one of those guys will be hopefully Jordan Jefferson, the a trained for defensive tackle from West Virginia. Because I see this as a matchup. The, the part that intrigues me is that Jalen Milrow is not exactly Peyton Manning. He's not going to stand in the pocket and pick apart a defense with his brain and not shortcoming, uh, shortchanging the guy in that manner. But he is what he is at this point. He's an athlete who's got a gun. So it's not like he doesn't have an arm. But when yeah. they're hitting plays for Alabama now, it's not 25 for 35 through the air. It's like, 12 for 20 and yeah. they're deep shots like they're coming after that LSU secondary for big chunks. Yeah, Milrow is an incredible deep ball thrower. I mean, that's all there is to it. And Bayham has done a really good job of giving him a bunch of deep shots that are wide open. So from an LSU perspective, you want to force Milrow to be an intermediate passer. He is by far, Mark, the leader in big time throw percentage, um, which means uh, the percentage of throws that go for huge chunks. Also, Jaden Daniels has been overall, in my estimation, the best deep ball throw in college football, um, which is a huge juxtaposition of what he was last year, which was not a great deep ball thrower, not a guy that really wanted to rip it. This year, he's been ripping it and leading the team uh, with a lot of you know gusto on and off the field. So you're going to see two explosive offenses, and it's going to be interesting, Mark, to see how explosive both defensive units are going to be. And one extra thing about this matchup, Mark, is these special teams, right? Bama, you know, during the Saban era, the one thing you always talk about is how bad their field goal kicking is. How I mean, it cost them dearly in um, some of these LSU Bama matches. Well, one of them in 2011. But he has got the best kicker and punter combo in, in, in America, I, 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 I would go off and say. And then at this point, LSU's kicker and punter is also good. So this should be a very interesting matchup on special teams as well. Carter, I'm going to go somewhere where we may sh in some way should have started this conversation, and that's because it's still Alabama LSU in the trenches. So whether it's Bama offense, LSU defense, vice versa, do you see any significant advantages on either side? Yeah, so I think in this matchup, you're seeing the best offensive line in the West for LSU go up against the best defensive line in the West uh, with Alabama. Of course, Texas A&M's defensive line is really talented, but I think Alabama's defensive front is the best in, uh, in, in the SEC West. And then on the other side of the football, this LSU defensive line without Wingo is concerning. They still have five-star Mason Smith and, and some other nice pieces. But this Bama offensive line has been very inconsistent, right? They're big. They're athletic. They're a bunch of four and five stars, really talented players. And one thing that they did a really good job of, Mark, versus Tennessee, and we talked about this on the SEC channel. If you're not an LSU fan, go check this out. Um, you know, I did a lot of Alabama-Tennessee uh, film studies. I was very impressed on a few of their explosive plays. They were able to get the Tennessee defensive lineman to the ground, which opened up huge holes to run through. And on two of those plays in particular, those were huge game breakers. So this Alabama offensive line, they're very inconsistent. They're very raw. But if they get a hold of you, you might go down. And if that's the case, Bama's going to take advantage of the whole left uh, from that. And, 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 and they're going to try and get explosives off of that. I don't think this LSU uh, team is intimidated in, in any way, in any environment. They've been to Ole Miss. They had to play in Orlando against Florida State and in previous years, obviously. But they go to Tuscaloosa. What is your confidence level? Uh, it's it's fairly high. I, I think the point spread is about where it needed to be, you know. I, I like betting. I, I, I like looking at point spreads. You know, I don't bet a lot. I'm not, um, you know. Steve Fezzik over here or anything like that. But I, I like watching point spreads, and it was interesting. You know, Circus Sports opened it at six, and I was like, oh, hammer that, all right? Because you're not going to get a better line than that from the LSU perspective. And, of course, it's floating now about three, three and a half. I, I, feel, I feel pretty good about LSU going into this just because of how well Jaden Daniels is playing. And 
Jaden has to carry more for his team to succeed than I think Jalen Milrow needs to because Jalen Milrow just has such a significant advantage when it comes to the defense and the home field, you know, advantage. But I think Jaden's going to get it done, Mark. I don't know exactly why. Of course, every LSU fan feels nervous. You know, on this show last year, I remember bringing up that this is so cool that this is the last matchup before we go to, you know, 12 teams in the playoffs. So this is a do or die game where next year won't be as much of a do or die game. Uh, so, yeah, I'm excited about this, and I'm also very excited about Jaden Daniels, uh, hopefully replicating what Joe Burrow did here in 2019 and winning this game in a shootout. I mean, you mentioned it. It's Alabama, LSU. Nothing else needs to be stated. Uh, this has been a rivalry under Coach Save that's been pivotal for, for three reasons. You talk about SEC championship implications. Here's the rivalry right here. You talk about in the past, the winner of this game has gone on to play for a national championship. Here it is right here. You talk about this game brings massive recruiting implications when you look at Coach Saban has been able to go down to the state of Louisiana and get whoever he wants to get versus Brian Kelly after his first win last year over Coach Saban. He's trying to keep a lot of those guys in the boot inside the boot. So this is a matchup where you look at recruiting, you look at championships, you look at nostalgia, you look at intense mental and physical energy being exhausted in this game here it is hey Stephen. beyond the three points that you just outlined which were on point no question about what this game has meant to the landscape of college football over the last 10 or 15 years what memories come to mind first and foremost for you when you think about this lsu matchup I think about the, the first year when Saban was at Alabama, 2007, and this is shortly after Coach Saban spent five years at LSU, uh, 2000 to 2004, uh, brought LSU a national championship in 2003 in the BCS era, and you had a lot of Tiger fans that felt like they were going to have the run of championships because Saban was starting to really build something in, the, in Baton Rouge. And then he comes to Alabama, and just the anger and frustration on the faces of LSU fans. Like, how could you do that? How could you spend five years with us, go to the NFL for a cup of tea, and then go to the enemy right after leaving the NFL for that cup of tea? And, and, and the LSU fans to this day still harbor something. I just can't believe he's there. Like he's over there in, in Alabama. It's been 17 years of this, but LSU fans still carry that that hurt of. Even though he has he's been gone since 04, 05, he went there. And I think that's the, the fondest memory I have of this rivalry as, as the LSU fans still holding. We could have had something more with Coach Saban. He left and he ends up somehow ended up in Alabama. <laughs> Oh, Stephen, we could go through the memories, but I think that's an excellent one just to kind of put the entire rivalry and series in the last 15 years in perspective, because we could talk about individual plays, the TJ Yeldon play in Death Valley in 2012 to win the game. We could talk about, of course, the game of the century the year before. We could go on and on about, uh, of course, Burrow versus Tua. What a classic game that was. And shoot, we could talk about last year's game was a heck of a ball game down to the wire. Uh, it, it, it's a lot. And uh, this game, as I mentioned, you expound a lot of physical energy, a lot of emotional and mental energy because a lot goes into this game. Uh, you look at this game has brought NFL scouts to the table. So many pro teams are looking for marquee players, marquee guys to draft, and they circle this game. Jim Nagy, the executive director for the Reese's Senior Bowl, he and his staff, they have this game circled every year. I go back to the 2011 9-6 game, Mark, that you referenced. 45 players combined from that matchup got drafted to play pro ball. You look at the 2019 game and the fire show that was between Burrow and Tua. So many players from that game got drafted. You even look at that 2015 Alabama LSU game. You talk about Derrick Henry and Leonard Fournette and how the Heisman switched hands that very night. So many guys from that team got drafted. So a, a lot is put in the melting pot when you discuss Alabama LSU. 
Stephen, talking about 2023, how healthy is this Alabama football team coming into this game? Uh, very healthy. The guys have the bumps and bruises out of the way. Uh, some guys were nicked up against Tennessee, uh, including one Jaden Roberts, the offensive line that has grown and that net guard position since getting his first start against Texas A&M. Uh, Malachi Moore is fully healthy. You know, he had a little bump and a bruise there against A&M as well. So this is a team. Uh, Tresman Marshall of a transfer from Georgia, healthy as well. He did not play a lot against Tennessee. Got kind of some spot action there, but he's good to go. So uh, the bye week was very good for Alabama to get all of those guys that had maybe a nick, maybe a nick here, a tuck there. They're full. They're, they're full ready to go now. This LSU secondary has been a bit of a mess, and it's kind of ironic because we're talking about uh, recent history, and of course, this has been one of the great uh, schools for secondary play in the nation. They would argue the best. I think it's a pretty good argument among four or five schools, but uh, they have had all sorts of issues despite talent on that side of the ball, and now you got a matchup with an Alabama team that doesn't necessarily want to live by the pass, but when they do go to the air, boy, they, they go for the throat. And they go for the uh, the the deep plays and the big chunk plays, and so that's going to be an interesting matchup to see uh, Jalen Milrow against this secondary. I mean, for LSU in the past, Mark, it's had the Patrick Petersons, it's had the the Derek uh, the Derek Stingleys, the, uh, the 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 Claybornes of the world. They've had marquee defensive backs, but and also Tyron Matthew as well. But Brian Kelly finds himself in a very very rough situation. He's got some injuries. And a lot of those in the secondary, Zai Alexander, your best corner, leading your team with seven pass breakups, he will not play. And then you're down two guys in terms of death. Denver Harris, a former five-star, remember Alabama recruited him hard. He chose Texas A&M. But then ends up going to LSU. Uh, he's out for this game due to an injury. And then Deuce Chestnut is out for this game due to an injury. So LSU's got starting corners and guys of depth that will not play in this game. So your biggest defensive back is going to be Andre Sam, uh, your safety, who leads your team with three interceptions. So that's going to be a lot of responsibility on him when you talk about Corralin, a Jermaine Burton, who's getting very, very hot at the right time. Isaiah Bond, who's immersed, is that number two option. You've got Kobe Prentice, who's made plays this season. He could be a number three. Amari Nyblak, your tight end, who could be flexed out as a wide receiver. He, he's he been chirping a bit this season. And then Nick Saban talked about this week, Kendrick Law, a young man from Louisiana, Shreveport, Louisiana, that for the first time this season against Tennessee, really started to get the ball more so towards his direction. And he's been kind of chomping at the bit here uh, for this matchup. So for Brian Kelly, not the situation he wanted to be in uh, when you talk about you have a starting corner and Zai Alexander not able to go and two of your depth guys, Denver Harris and Deuce Chestnut, not able to go. Stephen M. Smith, Touchdown Alabama. Please join him on his show Monday, Wednesday, and Friday in my own words, 6.30 Central Time. If you're not familiar and want to give it a go, this is a good week to do that. It's LSU week, and of course, CBS is going to be on the scene Saturday night, uh, one of the big games in college football. The winner takes control of the SEC Western Division. I don't know, Stephen, if LSU did not have the two losses that Jaden Daniels would not be uh, more uh, talked about among Heisman Trophy candidates. He's been that good most of the season, you know, maybe the marquee or the pinnacle moment would be having to put up in a loss all those points and all those yards to just try to stay in the game against an Ole Miss team that put up 55. Uh, so he's been really good. And, of course, LSU presents uh, a lot of issues uh, in the passing game with that wide receiver core. Uh, they do. And Jake Daniels has been unbelievable. You talk about a guy, former Arizona State transfer. Uh, he's been everything that Brian Kelly has wanted him to be and that the fan base of LSU has wanted Daniels to be. 30 total touchdowns, 25 of those passing. You look at the top quarterback in terms of passer rating in the SEC, uh, one of the top quarterbacks in the, in the whole country. You look at passer rating, completion percentage, QBR, 
know, all of those quarterback statistical numbers there. And the big thing with Jaden Daniels is he will use his athleticism. This is a young man that, that, that can run the ball, that can break, contain the pocket. And for Alabama, it's going to be huge this week to have your gap assignments, play with eye discipline, not become too pass rush happy. Uh, be able to not only – affect and get some type of pressure to Daniels, but also keeping him corralled and not allowing him to break outside your edges. Because we've seen this season where when Alabama has lost contain, whether it was Ole Miss's Jackson Dart or uh, Tennessee with uh, with Tennessee, you know, in, in that quarterback aspect with Joe Milton, when they've been able to break contain, they can pick up, you know, 10 to 15 yards with their legs. And that's how Jaden Daniels hurt Alabama last year. You know, 95 yards rushing in those big moments, he was able to pick up chunk plays with his feet. And a lot of those were not designed quarterback runs. It was just busted plays by Alabama's defense. So they have to be king there in the gap discipline. But Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr., two incredible wide receivers. Uh, Malik Neighbors, nine touchdown catches this season. Brian Thomas with 11. Uh, Brian Thomas was another one that was highly recruited by Alabama, but shows MSU in the recruiting circuit. Uh, remembering Mason Taylor, who caught the game-winning two-point conversion last year uh, to have MSU win 32 to. 31. Then you got Logan Diggs, a fine young running back, a guy at 6'1", 215 pounds, can break tackles, can run through the middle, can bounce plays outside, very uh, compact all around running back. So LSU's got weapons galore. This is a team that's averaging nearly 50 points a game. Uh, Alabama's got to start fast offensively. But defensively, the key here, Mark, for Kevin Steele and what he's been preaching to this group, do not get overly pass rush happy. If you know you cannot get the Jordan, uh, Jayton Daniels, affect his passing lane by knocking the ball down and forcing second and 10, forcing third and 10, just do things that create pressure to him as far as him not being able to complete passes to these game-changing receivers. Folks, if you've enjoyed the content, please like the video, subscribe to our SEC channel. The link's in the description section. Stephen M. Smith, Touchdown Alabama. Stephen, you know I'm going to do it to you. Give me one player, maybe two players that you think could be key in this one that maybe most people aren't thinking about. I, I, I'll, I'll go defense first. I, I think a player in this game that could have just a massive impact is going to be defensive tackle Tim Keenan. Tim Keenan has grown with each game this season that nose guard that nose guard spot uh, from the South Florida game on up. Uh, the Texas A&M game was probably his best game of the season. He had 10 tackles to lead the entire team. And Keenan, the young man from Birmingham, he dropped 30 pounds in the offseason to go to you know, 300, 320 pounds from 340 to from 350 to 320 pounds. So this is the guy that's gotten faster, quicker, uh, stronger on the inside. And his two-gap ability to be able to take space and allow other guys to roam around and make plays, Keenan is going to have a marquee matchup. So I look at him uh, defensively. Offensively, for me, this could be a huge game for Jalen Milrow. Jaden Daniels has gotten a lot of the conversation, but Milrow has grown as a quarterback in passing the football. Keep your eyes on this, Mark. Of, of, of Milrow's 13 touchdown passes, 10 of those have come from 20-plus yards. He's showing he can throw the deep ball, but not only that, he's gotten better in the short to intermediate passing game that's due to his relationship with Tommy Reese. These two have grown together as they've been called to develop together. So while Jaden Daniels has gotten a lot of the conversation in terms of what he does and what he brings, and rightfully so, this is a big chance here for Jalen Milrow at home at Brian Denny to have a marquee performance. I kind of go back to the 2015 Bama MSU game. The week of that game, Leonard Fournette grabbed all the highlights, grabbed all the headlines. And Alabama's defensive front was like, enough of this guy. You see, we have a running back as well, Derrick Henry. And Alabama's defense shut down for Ned. Uh, Derrick Henry had a show out of field day there, over 200 yards rushing and three touchdowns. The same thing could kind of play out here in this matchup. So offensively, looking at Jalen Milrow to kind of say, hey, I'm the other quarterback in this matchup, and I can do some things too.
At Bama, performance against Leonard Fournette in 2015 is one of the most devastating things I've ever seen. It was unbelievable. I, 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 I mean, Mark, I'm, I'm going to give you a funny backstory from that week of practice. It was crazy. So I remember I was in the press conference room. Uh, I think it was the Wednesday lead up to that game, uh, and everybody was surrounding Jonathan Allen, and he didn't want to talk to anybody. But all the media was all over Jonathan Allen. And they kept asking him about Fournette and how he's so tough to stop and nobody can, can take him down. And Jonathan Allen, just in this stoic but angry way, just looked at everybody and goes, Alabama does, we got him. And uh, the whole room was like, whoa, like, whoa, like how serious he like, didn't crack a smile, how serious that man was. And I remember Marlon Humphrey, a cornerback at that time, talked about it. He had to have his best week of practice getting ready for LSU because he knew if he didn't, the Allens, the the the, the Sean, the the Ron Paynes, the the Tim Williams, the Ryan Andersons, the Ashawn Robinsons, the Jaron Reeds, they would Ruben Fosters, they would jump all over Marlon Humphrey after practice if he didn't have a good practice that week for the LSU game. So that whole week of practice was menacing because they knew the assignment and the tags that were facing them. But those guys were ready for it. Bringing up some great names, too. Oh, man. Stephen M. Smith, Touchdown Alabama. Got to join him, uh, the whole crew there at TouchdownAlabama.com, but specifically on his show Monday, Wednesday, and Friday right here on YouTube. In my own words, 6.30 Central, folks. Stephen, we always appreciate you stopping by, laying down the knowledge for us. Mark, I appreciate you, man. Take care. It's going to be a fun game Saturday. Everybody's going to be down there, and I'm looking forward to a fun matchup.